Well, good morning, Bethel Cleveland. I'm honored to share this morning with you. So why don't you get a mug of your favorite coffee or tea, maybe something tasty for breakfast, and together, let's believe that God has something supernatural and powerful that he's going to release into your life. That in the middle of the mundane or routine, God's vibrant creative spirit is stirring and bringing an awakening to our hearts. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, there's so much activity happening in our lives, so many voices, so many opportunities to feel overwhelmed by it all. But in the end, but in the quiet, if we tune into the frequency of your presence, peace is released because we begin to realize you have been God a long time and you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing in the world all the way to you know what you are speaking to each one of our hearts. And we trust in you. You're the author and perfecter of our faith. You know the story because you wrote it. So thank you that we find our stability when we plant our feet on the rock of who Jesus is. Amen. This morning, I want to I talk to you. The title of my sermon is From the Altar to the Table. It's from one of my favorite songs, from Stephanie Gretzinger. It's called Remember. The chorus goes, Jesus, a lamb of God, oh, what a savior. You took the altar and made it a table. Nothing can separate what you bring together. Now and forever, I will remember. So that chorus has been running through my mind. And so today's sermon title, if there's a title, is From the Altar to the Table. And what is the true nature of freedom? I love how God speaks. How does he speak to you? One of my favorite ways that he does for me is when I'm in the middle of a conversation and he begins to weigh in. Does he ever do that to you? Recently, um, I was at a, a gathering of friends. We were having a meal, and uh, we had a really interesting topic get introduced. There's a belief out there right now that free will is an illusion and that it, that it doesn't exist. Um, the argument is that your life experiences and everything that's shaped who you are, down to your own desires, are decided like 30 decisions before you ever even came into the picture that we are framed by our environment and a product of the culture that we are raised up in. And it really, it got me thinking about what is the true nature, not just of free will, but actual freedom. Real freedom is found at the table. The altar was never a place to sustain communication. It was a place to die and a place for payment until Jesus took the altar and he became the feast, the communion table where his sacrifice was the meal. He turned the altar into a table and where religion will require death, Jesus pulls up a chair and invites us to sit with him because you can search all over the world, every religion, every God that's ever been worshiped or claimed and you will only find one, one God who died for his creation. Jesus, he stands alone. No other God ever did that. Only Jesus. So I've been on this journey, this, this search, if you will, about what, what it means to sit with God at the table. I have this dream that heaven, when I was growing up, I always pictured heaven to be like a cruise ship line buffet, white linen tablecloth, a lot of food set out, and lots of really loud worship going on and on and on. But the, the older I get and the more I dive in, the more I hope that heaven is like the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit seated at a table, talking, dinner, connection. And this morning, as we journey from the altar to the table, how can we look at the concepts and the commands of God from his perspective, from his mind and from his table? In the Old Testament, the peak of connection 
was walking with God in the cool of the day. That was the peak of connection. That is where Adam and Eve would walk with God. And I wonder, what did they talk about? Because there wasn't necessarily anything to apologize for. And what would your communication with God look like if it wasn't centered around repentance or requests? Now hear me out. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you for I am meek and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. We're meant to come to God with our repentance and requests. And I believe that there is even more to be discovered in addition to both repentance and requests. Because what if God was willing to make the most precious sacrifice so that we could be seated with him and part of his family? What if this morning you weren't just watching online or or scrolling by us by accident? What if God intended for you this morning, sitting in your kitchen, on your couch, with your family, what if he intended for you to realize how good and loved you are by him? Because that's just like him. That's who he is to create us, design our DNA, everything from the heartbeat to our lungs, our veins, our circulatory system. He did it all. He breathed into the dust and created life. Nothing with all of our technology can create a human soul out of dust. So here we are this morning, little dirt clods sitting on a couch or at a kitchen table with a mug of coffee but you're more than dust and you're more than dirt because you are the case that holds his divine presence, his divine breath. Nobody else can create a life out of nothing, go out to their backyard, form some dirt and breathe life into it. Only God can do that. We catch a glimpse of what that's like with our children, but to make something from nothing, only God can do that. And here's here's the crux of it. He didn't do it to prove a point. He didn't do it to, to show off. He doesn't have to prove anything. Every mountain, every beautiful, breathtaking scene we could ever see or enjoy, he made. He designed to look at it and for it, for it to look the way that it does and be structured the way it is. And he doesn't live in a frame of mind where he needs to make anyone feel small for him to be big. He doesn't have to use mind games or tricks or have strings attached to have love and be loved because he is love. Love exists within himself. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I grew up very conservative and we had this idea, at least I did, this idea that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Father was the one in charge and he was the strict one. Then you had Jesus, the one that everyone could relate to. And then the Holy Spirit, which was the gas that powered the whole engine, the whole thing. And I think that's maybe how a lot of us might feel. But uh, digging deeper into that, The reason why God created and the reason why we have relationship with each other is because relationship and fulfillment exists within himself. Three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, distinct, three separate, but in one. Heavenly conundrum to try to figure it out, yeah? But he is perpetually and utterly satisfied. And out of his completeness, he created the heavens and the earth. And he created you. And he decided that what he made was good. He didn't create us out of a need. He didn't create us out of some need for fulfillment or for validation or because he was lonely. Relationship and connection existed within himself. And so out of the overflow of himself, out of the overflow of his satisfaction, we were born out of out of creativity creative passion and love from that relationship so that we could be destined to be included in this circle of relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one that has no end. That relationship that for all of eternity, because he was never created, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in divine relationship with one another. And out of that overflow, you and I find ourselves this morning in a place where we can be invited into that circle of relationship. 
If it were any other way, if he created us to fill a need, then that means that if we didn't meet the standard, if we weren't able to deliver on the expectation, then there could be fear or manipulation or pressure to meet that expectation. But God has no manipulation in his character because there is no fear in love. And God is love. So there, there's no need for him to use power balance or leverage to try to achieve love. It exists inside of himself. Manipulation is not an effective tool when you have zero fear and you're utterly and perpetually satisfied within yourself. God has made you to live in that realm. But then the fall came. Eve took the apple and together she and Adam ate the fruit. And for the first time, humanity knew what shame was. You see, it says in Genesis that prior to that moment, they wore no clothes, but they felt no shame. But the very first thing that they felt when they tasted that fruit was shame, and they tried to cover themselves. And when the cool of the day came, they hid from God. Humanity had given the keys of authority up, They decided they wanted to choose what was good and evil for themselves. And Adam and Eve turned from seeing through a clean and unfiltered lens. Their view of creation was found within the perspective of the creator. And they turned from the relationship and they changed the dynamic of of relationship with God. And, And so instead of the cool of the day, now we find the altar has become the new place to meet with God. And so we begin our journey this morning from the altar to the table. If you have your Bible, could you turn to Genesis 4? Or if you're on your iPhone, pull up that Bible app. Genesis chapter 4, it says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was angry in his countenance. His face fell. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You see, even when the dynamic of relationship was dramatically changed and the altar became the place for payment and death before connection, God was still looking at the heart and the motivation. And as we journey from the altar to the table and discover what the true nature of freedom is, the truth for a lot of us is that we define freedom by our most current need or difficulty, what we'd like to be released from. You see, Freedom to Cain, it looked like freedom from jealousy and comparison by eliminating the competition. I don't want to make anybody squirm in your seat, but have you ever dealt with jealousy or comparison and thought that maybe eliminating the competition was the way to go, that if that one person wasn't there, you'd get to do what you dreamed of. If that one person wasn't there, you'd be able to have that job, have that position, that that person is the cap that is keeping you from your destiny. You see, that's the lie that jealousy tells us that what you bring to the table, it's not necessary because another person is seated out there and from your perspective, they do better. Jealousy is the counterfeit response to heaven's invitation to pursue and step into your calling. I wonder... And I know that many of us have felt this, but if you've ever been in the position where the competition finally did leave, the truth and the reality hits that that person was never your cap. That somebody's gifting or somebody's talent being gone didn't mean that you were all of a sudden going to ascend into a new position because it was never determined by the person who you thought was better. It was always determined by your inner voice and what you believed and what you thought about yourself. And I think often we take the bait of jealousy. You see, jealousy is the enemy's counterfeit response to God's invitation. 
If you look at somebody doing something you love to do and your response is, man, I wish they'd just get out of there so that I could do it. You're in the wrong frame of mind. You're taking the enemy's bait. The truth is, if you see God doing it through somebody else, that means he can do it through you. If he's doing it through them, it's, it's a precursor. It's him showing you it is possible. He did it through them and he can do it through you. Taking God's invitation provokes us to step up from a place of just trying to be and just trying to prove that we are something and stepping up into a place where we recognize that we must become. Cain's method to achieve that freedom had a high price tag because he discovered that eliminating the competition, it didn't set him free. And so it got me thinking as, as we're going from the altar to the table, what... What does freedom lived out look like to God? How does he live out his freedom? Somebody with no limits, somebody who obviously has never dealt with sin or, or struggle in that way. What does freedom look like to God? And I just had this memory pop up into my mind. I think it was 2010, I joined our original class of BSSM here at Cleveland. And um, I had the opportunity to be able to lead worship for it. And it was the very first environment where I was singing in front of a room where, honestly, you just had to stand up there and be like, holy! And everybody was all in. There was no waking up. There was no preaching. Everybody was literally running to the throne before I even had a chance to open my mouth. And I felt like God was asking, what, what kind of a worship leader are you when you're not afraid of the response of the room, when you're not afraid of maybe what other people think of you, and when you're not afraid of even like effectiveness, how can I lead people into an encounter? What, is, what kind of a worship leader are you when all of those fear factors are gone and all that remains is the presence of God in open and willing hearts? Who are you then? And I think as we think about that, if you can get into that mindset about what your dream would look like if fear wasn't a factor, you'd start to jump into the, to the realms of where God lives with his freedom. You see, freedom doesn't mean I stop behaviors that I have deemed sinful or, or, or ungodly. It's, it's not about meeting a list of demands or even a standard. If we were to stand in front of God and declare, you've never sinned, praise you. It wouldn't even make any sense as a compliment because it's not a part of his nature. So to base our definition on our ability to abstain from certain behaviors or sin means that we are living under a limited understanding of what kind of freedom is accessible through the blood of Jesus. The meaning of freedom is usually processed with direct connection to sin or shame. Romans 7, Paul even references, he says, I'm a mystery to myself for I want to do what is right and end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. We pursue freedom to experience relief from sinful desire and bondage, but, but really it's the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's his power at work that we are able to be set free from sin and bondage and to begin to think like him. And freedom isn't just being able to have holy or righteous desires alone. The idea that when freedom's released or given that we now have an ability to be holy now, as if, as if freedom could be reduced to just a simple explanation that God wants to rewire your behaviors. Righteousness and holy desires are the fruit of freedom, but not freedom itself. You see, the death and resurrection of Jesus broke the power of every bond, every chain of the enemy. Every curse was broken when the sun rose on the third day and the body of Jesus lay still when all of a sudden his heart began to pound and breath stirred in his lungs and he sat up in victory over death, over sin, and over all creation. So to define freedom by anything less than that, by simplifying the meaning of freedom to just acting within our paradigm of what we think is good and evil falls short of your new birthright. It is the smallest glimpse of what true freedom is. Circling back to that dinner conversation, when we were talking about the nature of free will, the very first thing that popped into my mind was a conversation from this book called The Shack. When I was in ministry school, it was assigned to us uh, our book list, but back then it was considered a really controversial book. So I went to the bookstore. It's called Heaven on Earth Christian Books. And um, 
I couldn't find the book anywhere. So I went up to the counter and I, I asked and they pulled it out and it was in a brown paper bag. And they said, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yes. I've read it about six times and I just love the, um, the subject matter it tackles and the questions that it asks. You see, it, it, our main character, Mac, faces incredible heartbreaking loss and how he processes that when he finally gets a note from God to meet him at the place of his pain, the shack. He has a weekend encounter with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they tackle so many questions that I think all of us have. But this one specifically I wanted to read to you. Let me open it up for you. They are sitting at the table, and Mac asks some questions about the nature of freedom. And he's having a conversation with God the Father. He says, you knew I would come, didn't you? Well, of course I did, said God. Then was I free not to come? Did I not have a choice in the matter? Good question. And how deep would you like to go? Like, do you believe you're free to leave? Well, I suppose I am. Of course you are. I'm not interested in prisoners. You're free to walk out of this house right now. Just because I know you're too curious to go, does that reduce your freedom to leave? Now brace yourselves for this next part. Or if you want to just go a bit deeper, we could talk about the nature of freedom itself. Does freedom mean that we are allowed to do whatever you want to do? Or we could talk about all the limiting influences in your life that actively work against your freedom, your family genetic heritage, your specific DNA, your metabolic uniqueness, the quantum stuff that's going on on a subatomic level where only I am the always present observer, or the intrusion of your soul sickness that inhibits and binds you, or the social influences around you, or the habits that have created synaptic bonds and pathways in your brain. And then there's advertising, propaganda, and paradigms. And inside that confluence of multifaceted inhibitors, what is freedom really? Only I can set you free. God lives outside of our social constructs. Therefore, he's able to set us free from ours from our paradigms shaped by our life experience and by those who have come before us. Like this, this idea of free will not existing, it's a diagnosis that reaches deeper than the idea of free will, but, I, but it's more about identifying who your master is. Because outside of Jesus, we are all slaves to sin. We are slaves to where you were born, the culture that shaped your moral compass, the decisions we, that we made based on avoiding pain and fear from discovering all the possibilities that God intended for us that we miss while serving the master of fear and sin. I want you to picture sin like a roof held up by these pillars. And these pillars are all of the limiting influences in your life. It's, it's your upbringing. It's your talent. It's your skill set. It's all, all of those things that you feel have inhibited you and uh, altered the way that you make decisions. You see, when, when, when God comes in with his freedom, he knocks out those pillars and he takes off the roof and we're able to see into the limitless expanse of who Jesus is and what he paid for and what he's given to us. And so that that roof that, that created limits in our life because of sin, our upbringing, things that maybe even would have limited our ability to even determine if we had free will or not. That master, that rooftop of sin, and those pillars that held it up of our life experience are destroyed and obliterated by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross. We are invited to the table where we become. We've become his sons and daughters and that feeling of safety that so often leaves us in adulthood when we begin to see the brokenness or the humanity of our parents and family is restored and we become children again, unconcerned with how we look, maybe even our achievements, but alive in the creativity of God. Living in the moment with a deep sense of belonging where we are part of the family that we are proud to show to our, we're proud of our family to show our friends and family and the people around us so they can experience the joy of what it means to sit at the table of God. Real freedom exists outside of our perceptions of what we think is holy or righteous and resides at the feet of Jesus. It lives where we have given our thoughts of what God should be like or, or how he should do things. Because, you know, we all have a trauma. We all have events in our life that have shaped us in some way. And it's shaped that paradigm that filters all this information and gives us a unique idea of what God wants. But free will 
It's the spirit of God inside of you that empowers you to live outside of all the boundaries. And his spirit empowers us to act outside of hell's destiny for our life. It breaks generational curses and frees us to be different than what our life maybe has shaped us to be. I want to sit at the table and learn about who he is. Because if it's different than I know or different than I would have experienced, I want to see it. You see, the Pharisees, they couldn't see. The Pharisees couldn't see God when he was standing right in front of them. Their entire life and legacy was based on identifying the signs and understanding what it would look like when Jesus arrived on the scene. But when he was standing right in front of them and speaking words of life, they couldn't hear him because he didn't look like they thought he would. He didn't have the mission exactly as they interpreted. And I, and I think that in our hearts, we don't want to miss Jesus when he's walking in the room because he doesn't mean our expectations or how we thought he should look. They couldn't believe that he would eat with sinners and prostitutes, that he would touch lepers or speak with a Samaritan woman or invite a tax collector to be one of his followers, recruit fishermen of no reputation and travel around the world with signs and wonders and not just pretty theoretical words. They weren't ready for a freedom not rooted in rule following or behaving but one that called for something more, and they couldn't conceive the idea that beyond a checklist, Jesus came straight for the heart. This morning, you're sitting at your table. You're sitting at your couch. We're just having a conversation together. And I just feel like it would be such a shame if we miss the opportunity to invite you to come to the table and enter into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've spent most of your life thinking that Jesus was simply just a a figure or a figurehead of the religion and that it was a big, massive line of rules and behavior modification. But I'm here to tell you this morning that it is about taking that journey from the altar where all we thought that God required was death and journeying to the place where you are seated at the table with the family of God and you're not trying to be anything anymore. You've just simply become because God chose you. If you're in a place this morning where you don't know Jesus, or if you're in a place where you know that your heart isn't right, that if you were to be honest this morning, sitting in your house, and you looked at your life, and you looked at the evidence, not just like declaring scriptures or phrases, but if you looked at the evidence, and you didn't see the fingerprints of God everywhere, that, the, that what is flowing out of your heart and your life doesn't reflect a connection with Jesus, I'm here to say this is your morning to get your heart right with Jesus. He has an incredible adventure. He has an incredible plan and destiny for your life. That it doesn't end with us laying down the altar, it, but, it, but it continues with us seated at the table with Jesus. If you want to join the family this morning, if you're tired of dead, dry religion, and you're tired of rule following, you're tired of emptiness and brokenness, Jesus will fulfill everything that you have ever desired. Why does he do that? Because we were created to live in communion. It was heaven's intention all the way back to the garden that we would walk with God in the cool of the day, that that relationship from the Father, Son, Holy Spirit that's been going on for all of eternity, that you're simply grafted into that circle of relationship and that for the rest of eternity, you're seated at the table and in the family of God. If you'd like to give your heart to Jesus this morning, I want you to close your eyes, put your hand over your heart. You don't have to repeat after me. I'm just going to pray. Jesus, if you agree, Jesus, thank you that you eliminated the space. Thank you that every boundary, every wall, everything in my life that could have separated me from you was destroyed by the blood of Jesus. And that because of your death and because of your resurrection, your Holy Spirit can live inside of me. So right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come live in me. Come be the Lord of my life. I want to become a Jesus follower. I want to become a friend of God. I want to join the family. Thank you for everything. Thank you for including me. In Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer this morning, we're going to have a a text screen that you can text and let us know. We want to celebrate with you. The Bible says all of heaven celebrates when someone gives their heart to Jesus. So just text us if you gave your heart or recommitted your life to him this morning. 
thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us, Bethel Cleveland. We bless you in your coming and going. And God, we just bless you to experience the presence of God and levels that you've, that you've yet to feel and see and that you would hear his voice right up in your ear and you'd feel the closeness of God, that he has destiny, promise, purpose over your life and that the best is yet to come. Amen.